thank you so much for your time sir my pleasure we'll start with how genpack started mm. and how genpack the startup grew from where it was to become genpack the company where it is now sure. what have been what has been the journey like and and what mm. were the lessons that you've learned in the journey mm. some major ones mm. that you could share sure you know genpack was a true startup because it was born of a new idea and the idea i think was simple in its design but in hindsight it was very innovative you know it was a path breaking idea which has created an entire industry in mm -hmm. this country um and that time quite honestly i worked for ge which was a company which encouraged you to take risks every morning you had to wake up and say is there a new idea is there something new you've tried have you you know we used to call it business development but every business development meeting that we would have would be what is the new product that you're doing what is the new area that you get into what new geographies are you going into so genpack was born out of that so even though it was tried and un untried and untested the company was daring enough to give me money and say go try it to be honest every part of it was a adventure and a unknown territory you know we had no infrastructure we had no offices properly we had no transportation we had no employees who were we could hire who were already experienced in anything that we were doing um we didn't have the equipment we didn't have telecom we didn't have phones we didn't have anything so every day was so innovation became a necessity and i think mother road is <laughs> is the you know creates a lot of uh, invention and i think that really propelled us to find new solution now we looked for surrogates for everything you know if we didn't have telecom backups then we created our own backups we didn't have power backups we created our own we needed employees trained in certain things so we hired trainers from all over the world brought them in to train our employees specifically in these areas uh it was very tough you know we were every day was a new problem every day was a finding a better solution how do you get employees to work on time you know what are if parents would come to ask us to visit our offices to say what are all these women doing here in the middle of the evening mm -hmm. <laughs> you know wh what are they doing show us how you're training them uh, it was in the hiring processes we were hiring by then so many people and yet nobody had hired at that scale um, so you had to create the entire ecosystem around us we didn't know how to transition processes technically um, how do you take a process from one place of the world to another these are complex processes run on cutting edge platforms and systems none of which was known to us before that um so that was a very interesting journey till of course very quickly into it we realized we had a tiger by the tail and we realized that this was a big idea and we were wrestling with it every morning <laughs> as to how do we control it I remember one of my new bosses at that time in Jinani Bakali came to visit me and he had just been appointed and his words to me was promote I want to see what is this monster you are building <laughs> and I remember looking at him and saying this monster will be one of the biggest businesses you've seen um so it was very fascinating we then had to learn to spin away from G you know we were a captive So we did all of that. We got that right. We stabilized. We had a lot of issues with process st stabilization. We made a lot of errors. Um, things wouldn't go wrong. Payments wouldn't happen. People's, you know, the help desks wouldn't work. People would call in. The phone lines would be down. Every day was pandemonium and chaos at some level. We got through all. We then went on to the next level, which was spinning away from GE and competing. You know, at that time we were competing against Accenture, IBM, HP, etc., and we had never been in this market before. We did not have the advantages of the IT companies they had. They were competing with a labor arbitrage before any of the multinationals were here. We were competing with multinationals while they were already established here. Mm -hmm. So we couldn't compete just on cost. So we had to build real expertise, and we had to. We went through an enormous journey of learning, but we learned quickly because. You know, failure is good. Failure is good. Uh, we lost a lot of deals in the beginning. <laughs> I remember our private equity owners at that time were not amused, and uh, we had to get together, think about competitive strategy, think about culture, think about what we were trying to build. 
and then figure out where to take this. How do we compete against Accenture, which has 3,000 partners around the world? I had four people. <laughs> um, how do we compete against IBMs, HPs of the world? What is our competitive differentiator? And we did this very systematically. We got the help of people like Ram Charan who came in. We did it extremely systematically, thoughtfully, and we really came out swinging. And we were recording triple digit growth rates in our global business uh, for the first five years, first three, four years, I think. We then had to recognize that, okay, the days of labor arbitrage was dead. And therefore, what do we do next? And it moved from labor arbitrage to expertise. Real expertise in business process management. Real expertise in saying this is how an accounts payable process should work. This is how a supply chain process should work. This is how a banking operation should work. And that translation of labor arbitrage to expertise became seminal for us in building trained experts who could sit across the table with anybody in the world and say we are the best at it. We know how to manage a business process end to end better than anybody else in the world. I remember we came up with that dialogue also <coughs> in 2005, 2006 as our key competitive advantage and it really worked. You know, Jen Pack today, of course I, I quit about four or five years ago, but today Jen Pack is 2.3, 2.4 billion dollars, 75,000 employees, 26 countries. So it's been phenomenal as a country, as a business. And really we have pioneered this business not just in India, we pioneered it in China, in Eastern Europe, in Mexico, in many other parts of the world. And I'm very proud of the impact we've had on the societies and the employees and the people around us. I think that has been very, very powerful. Absolutely, and, and you truly are a success story in yourself. And people do look up to you for the kind of learnings that you've learned and they want to really replicate them in their lives and in their businesses in every possible way. Um, how did you make people believe in your idea when you were with GE and going yes. forward, how did you make people, including your family, believe that you could actually make something as big <laughs> as Indian BPU yes. industry? I never got my family to believe it. I okay. think they were <laughs> probably happier with me being part of GE because you know, GE Capital the thing is you have a very nice business card when you're absolutely, with GE. Absolutely. You can walk into any door. And suddenly you're part of Genpact and everybody's saying, who? Especially when Genpact is small. So I think those are things that India traditionally and conventionally is very risk of us. En enormously risk. People don't break, break glass here. People don't, there is a glass ceiling, people won't push against it. People don't fight the status quo. We're very passive. I think, in some ways, which is why we tolerate our infrastructure, our roads, the corruption, everything else, you know. It's a shamble. I mean, well, how can we tolerate this? As a nation, as a middle class, I think, I wish we were all far more um, impatient and far more vocal in expressing our dissatisfaction with the way things are. Because we should be, you know. We, why should we tolerate it the way it is today? We should fight. So I think the family and convention makes you feel very complacent and comfortable. And inevitably, still, today, my family will still say, relax, take it easy, why are you always fighting? And I say, you know, if I lose my fight, I might as well die, you know? <laughs> There's no point. Um, I think certainly, if you look at, think about Genpac and the risks we took and how we, how we progressed, the teams we got were full of people by necessity who loved this challenge. You would not be here. So we hired great people, but by definition almost, people who are able to join you when you're a risk taker. Of course, we had the GE legacy with us. And the same team carried on. But you know, we did hire a lot of people based on saying, this is a new idea. This is a startup. It should work. It might not work. Are you ready for that? That drives a certain type of person to come to you. And I think that is what really propelled us forward. I also think as a culture, we built enormous teamwork. 
we work together really well. I am very proud of one fact. I think in Genpak, the longevity of our senior management team is legendary almost. You know, people have been there 15, 18 years, right from Tiger Thiagarajan, who's the current CEO, has been there, worked with me for 15 years, 18 years. Um, they're a family. They work together as a family. They know each other that well. They go on holidays together. They go, on, they go away all the time together. They, it's important that you feel your bond. You spend 12 hours a day at work. Mm -hmm. If you don't love it, don't be there. First of all, do something else with your life. You know, you have one life to lead. So we built bonds, we built culture, we did a lot of workouts, we did a lot of offsites. we would spend time with each other. And we tightened the bonds which allowed the team to work because we knew every day would be a new challenge. And you could not anticipate it. We also empowered the teams, I think. By nature, I'm not a very detailed guy, to be honest. Therefore, I really didn't want everybody coming to me on everything. And I just said, just deal with it. I will deal with just the exception. And it made them feel very empowered. We encouraged new ideas. Because we had to be innovative, you know, we were, that was forced on us. <laughs> sure. It wasn't something I could, I said, be innovative. We had to be. They had, you know, suddenly we got an opportunity, for instance, to start business process management in Dalian, in China for Japan. Now imagine a bunch of Indians sitting in Delhi, in Gurgaon, being told, go to Dalian in China, who probably have never seen an Indian before, and teach the Chinese who speak Japanese to do Japanese transactions from mainland China under the supervision of Indians, right? <laughs> it's, you know, the Tower of Babel, right? It could be, anything could happen in those language translations. But that was the joy and the thrill of doing something like that. You either loved it or you didn't want any part of it. And you have to hire people who love that thrill. When you get that, you get a different energy and a force in the company. Absolutely. You just touched upon the point of senior management and you have some people for a long, long time, and including Tiger. But you have had a phase where a lot of senior management guys left, you know, and, and left in a very short span of time. And I'm not aware of any such phase. Never. Ever. Okay, there, <laughs> there were some news items that talked about Riju left and, and that, you know, that maybe phase uh, no, I'm talking no, about. We, we have a ton of people. Okay. No, I think very few. I the launch, and I won't speak for Genpak last four years because mm -hmm. I'm not there. But sure. I, then I know the people, they're all there. Not at all. We had so many people. I mean, I, uh, Riju, by the way, Riju's back. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Which sure. I think needs to, you need to. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, I need know. to agree on that. She, she just come back. No, not at all. Ever. We never had a phase where lots of people. Sure. Just in one of the interviews with our group only, you mentioned yeah. that Riju left because she did not find. I, I didn't. I would have mentioned it. I yes. wouldn't have mentioned it. I doubt it. Uh, but anyway. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so you said Maybe that she left because else. she didn't get uh, as many opportunities to grow and she was looking for something new and, and another yeah. level altogether. I wouldn't have said that at all. One, I don't comment on people specifically okay. or individually ever. Okay. And I wouldn't have said that. And. Just for information, she's back. <laughs> okay, so so I'm glad uh, the people's strategy in Gen Pact are in place. Let's touch upon uh, some of. We've this. never lost great people. It's very rare. Sometimes you lose great people because there's someone above them who isn't going anywhere for a while. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you don't. Our attrition rates, I think, I'm still right on this, at VP and above level, of attrition of people we would love to hold on to is less than 5%. Sure, and otherwise... Over the last 10 years. Sure, otherwise the generic attrition... I don't know what it is. I think if you look up the quarterly reports, okay. uh, Tiger mentioned it. I think it's about 25-27% okay. overall, which is half of industry average. Okay. That uh, includes our call center and everything. Sure. And counting from day one, not counting from day 60 or something, which people okay. do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. I get your point. Um, so what is actually right about Genpact's people's strategy that people like to stick around for like 15 years and, uh, and, and so on? You know, you have to follow certain principles, sure. which I think are very important. One is fairness. People must know you're fair and that you care deeply. 
it can't be superficial. That you will go out of your way to help a person if they need help, if they have a health problem, etc., etc. You will do things for women which are special. You will help people work from home. So we have a large pool of people who work from home. You will help people with education, further education, even while they are work. So we've got arrangements set up with universities all over the country, which allows them to get degrees, etc., and allows them to push this education at work program through. Very importantly, you want to energize and empower people. You know, I've always had a statement which says, you know, happy, energized, empowered people will deliver great business service to anyone. Fundamental. You're spending 12 hours a day. I hope you come to the office and you love it. You have to have an informal culture. Easy interaction, informal. I'm not part of Genpack for the last five years, so I, I want to make sure that, you know, you'll have to talk to Piyush and Tiger about that. But that's what we did in the early days. So this was, these were teams which loved, spend, which spent a lot of time with each other, which played hard, which worked very hard. And I think it's that conglomeration of things that you do People must know that they will be treated very, f they will be pushed to the limit. I certainly wasn't an easy boss. I will push you to the limit, but I will defend you also to the limit, to whatever power I have. And I will fight for you to the death. And I think people must know that. That we will be very, very fair, very open, very transparent. There is no one who could come to me and say, I've heard this. What is your answer? And I would duck the question. I would say people would come. To, and there are things we used to use. I mean, you know, people would come to me and say, you hired somebody else from the outside who is being paid more than me. To which I would say, yes, that will happen all your life. Please get used to it. You know? And my answer to that was, OK, what do you want me to do? Do you want me to take a salary up? They said, yes. So I said, okay, I'll do it on the condition that if I hire somebody in your level lower than your salary the next time, I will take a salary down. At that point, nobody ever argued with that. Nobody ever brought that argument up again. So it's very basic common sense things that people relate to. There is an emotional bond also to the company, which is important. It's not just business. It's deeply emotional. It's deeply personal. Business is deeply personal. And you need to appeal to all of those senses to make people feel this is a place which I want to spend the rest of my life at. Charles, um, presently India is booming with the term startup. Everyone, yes. every second person is coming up with a startup of his own. Yes. Nothing wrong with entrepreneurship. Sure. But clearly, startups are uh, appearing to be a bubble that is bursting gradually now. It's not a bubble. Okay. Not a bubble at all. Most startups fail. That's life. Ninety percent of startups will fail. And then they will continue. And then they will learn and evolve and do something different. How do you view the Indian startup industry and what do you think is going wrong, particularly with the I don't think anything is going wrong. I think I don't know why the media thinks it's going wrong. Okay. I think the media's understanding of the startup world is deeply inadequate. Sure. <laughs> and I think they think failure is wrong. It isn't wrong. The statistics and the odds are that 90% of startups will fail. Okay. The ones everybody talks about are the most successful ones. And they don't talk about all the others who en route have failed, the thousands and thousands. The key question to me is more, what happens when they fail? Mm -hmm. Is there someone else, somewhere else they can go? Are there, is there somewhere else they can join? Are there companies that will absorb them? And if the economic system is vibrant, then it will do so. But for the next 20 years, I think India's startup uh, scene is fantastic. We've come from nowhere to be the second or third largest startup system in the world. I wish we would congratulate ourselves on that and not say it's a bubble and not say, you know, there's something wrong with it. What do you, ex you expect? Do you honestly expect every startup to be successful? <laughs> you know, it won't be, right? And therefore, I think it's a cause for enormous celebration. Frankly, most Indians are entrepreneurial because they couldn't get organized sector jobs. You know, 90% of our sector goes to the unorganized sector. Sure. They're entrepreneurs. Now you're seeing all these people suddenly convert to being organized entrepreneurs. It's fantastic. I just hope 
our media, our culture, our society allows them the opportunity to fail. You know, I would love to see a page in the Times of India saying, these are successful startups and these are failed startups, which did very well, but still failed. And look what they're doing now. You know, to me, that would be exciting. <laughs> sure. Could you share some some lessons that you've learned uh, while creating Genpac mm -hmm. that the Indian startups could uh, follow and uh, mm -hmm. lead to mm -hmm. a successful path, rather yeah. successful path than yeah. a failure uh, path? Well, I think, you know, um, I don't know that you will create more success than failure. We must just get used to that fact. 90% of startups will fail. Otherwise, they can't, you know, it's not like, um, it's a highly competitive place, right? So every startup that thinks of a new idea, there are five other guys thinking about the same idea. Mm -hmm. And someone has a better model and they will make it work. Sure. I think in terms of lessons, there are many. Um, hire great people. Always I hire ahead of the curve. Mm -hmm. You are never, ever, not once in my life have I come across a startup, I invest a lot in many startups. Sure or in Genpai, have I ever been at a situation where I've said, oh, I've hired too quickly. I've never had that situation. <laughs> so hire great people as early as you can. Empower them, depend on them. Build a culture that is really substantial. Test yourself in the marketplace often. There is only one reality in this marketplace, which is the customer. So keep testing against the customer as, many of, as often as you can. Learn finance. You know, finance is a language of business. Mm -hmm. You need to learn how to read a balance sheet and a P&L. You need to know how those things happen. So I think, I, I don't want to go on. I mean, there are so many lessons. Um, be wary of mentors. <laughs> it's one thing I would tell you. Be wary of mentors who've never had an exit. You know, every corporate honcho I meet is a mentor. Well, you know, in startups and equity investments and things like that, Exits are very important. So if people haven't exited from businesses successfully, they don't know what that feels like or how difficult it is. Mm -hmm. you know? Learn the art of raising money. It's going to be fundamental to who you are uh, as you go forward. I, I, I think too many people are so enamored by the idea that they forget that if they can't raise money, they're not great marketing guys, they're not great sales guys, their idea will never see light of day. Um, and I think those are things where be be uh, you must have a very positive outlook. I think you have to be an optimist, but at, at the same time, you know, don't take all the advice you will get. <laughs> the world is full of advice; most of it is nonsense. And follow your follow your gut. To me, you know, that's what we did with Jetpack. We just followed our gut and followed our passion and conviction for an idea. If you don't, if you can't do that, don't be a star. And no fear of failure. You know, you have to have the ability to take risks and you shouldn't worry about failing. It's part of life. Sure. Uh, coming back to the uh, BPO industry that you've laid the foundation of. Yes. Um, it was call center years back. It has transformed to, yes. to a BPO industry yes. now. Yes. Where is it? Uh, heading to and, and what transformations yeah. are we likely to see yeah. with respect to the processes and the automation that is coming in yes you know uh, sure. within the industry sure. itself sure. you know one of the uh, I think the smarter decisions I made I made many stupid ones one of the smarter decisions was not to be in the call center business that big okay. it allowed us and today if you look you know very little of Genpac's business is call center it allowed you to build expertise in many far more higher value added areas as this industry evolves, it's going to move towards expertise. So you are going to have to have people who are real experts in business process management, who understand end-to-end -end how business processes will work. That means having expertise in digital, in lean, in technology, in analytics, in big data, all of that. Mm -hmm. You have to become a subject matter expert. And I think once you've done that, you can then evolve into building products. Today we serve other customers. Tomorrow we should be selling what those customers are selling. There's no reason why we can't build a 
marketing company from here, a data sciences company from here, which is going out to end consumers. We haven't cracked that yet. We are still very much a B2B industry. And my question is, when will we become a B2C or a B2 little b industry where we really take a complete suite of products out to customers of all kinds? Um, that's quite some time away because I think, I fear that our industry is not innovating. We're still doing business the way we started doing it 20 years ago. And I think that's somewhat dangerous. Um, I think we have to take risks, we have to innovate, we have to try new things, you know. We have to get out of the main cities. Um, there's a 20 to 30 percent cost advantage in tier three cities. Um, why aren't we all going there? You know, how will we do that? Gurgaon didn't exist when we started. Maybe many other cities that don't exist today will exist in future because someone's taking the plunge to go out there and get that cost advantage. It's like moving manufacturing from Japan to China. Someone took that plunge. You know, we have to do similar things. Absolutely. Could you suggest some innovative steps that the BPU industry can take now to transform, uh, you know, and take the next level that you're just mentioning? I think basically build product experts. It really must. And pick four or five products and say, I'm going to be unique at selling these products, not as a FTE per, per annum billing, but as a product. So certainly transforming your entire billing from FTE based to product based I think is a huge step that has to happen soon. Um, two is become real expertise where if somebody wants to get somebody in supply chain they necessarily come to our industry because we are the best at it in the world and I think that level of expertise I don't think we are there yet. We're getting closer to it where we can truly go to a customer and say, I am better at doing, managing your business processes than you will ever be. Because I have this army of people and wealth of experience, which allows me to build best practices and cutting edge tools and technologies. And I can drive productivity to a very different level. Three, we must embrace artificial intelligence, machine learning automation, digitization, ourselves, and drive it for the customer. I think once we take hold of it, as opposed to fearing it and saying, oh my God, look what's going to happen to my business, I think we will transform the way we think and find new business opportunities. Sure. Thank you so much for your time, sir. My Thanks pleasure. for your input. Thank you.